talk about pollinators. We love talking about beneficials and pollinators um, is always a good topic. Um, uh, my name is Lizzie. I am the lead extension scientist at CESA and I'm going to start off the presentation today and then I'm going to hand over to Lewis for a bit in the middle. Um, the topics that we're going to be covering today are a little bit about what pollination looks like in Australian agriculture. We'll talk about some different types of pollinators which you might not have come across before. We'll talk about the different kind of plants which you might be looking at to support pollinators in your gardens and then how you can get to know the local pollinators in your area. So I always like to start off my presentations just thinking a little bit more broadly about insects and the jobs that they do for us in our ecosystems. We call these things ecosystem services, any kind of benefit that we get from insects or any other um, animals and, um, and um, uh, other kind of uh, ecological um, things in our ecosystems. Um, and there are actually lots of different ways that insects will help us. Um, you know, we need insects in our soil to decompose the, the dead matter to go back to get the nutrients back in the soil. Um, we need them for pest control, which is something that we talk about quite frequently as well, getting those good bugs in to make sure that, um, you know, they can help us deal with our pests. They can also help disperse seeds. So there's a really interesting evolutionary connection between insects and the dispersal of seeds and a really good source of food. But of course, today we're going to be focusing on pollination and this very, very important service that insects provide to us, especially in agriculture. So if we think very, very broadly about what pollination is, I think most people kind of have an idea, but it's also kind of important just to set um, the expectation of, of what pollination is at the very beginning. Because pollination doesn't just happen by bees. There are a lot of plants which will self-pollinate, for example. Uh, pollination can also happen by wind you know, just the blowing of spores and, and blowing of pollen from one tree to another through water and, of course, through animals. So the real, when it gets down to the near, real nitty gritty of it, the pollination is just getting the male um, sperm from the plants into the female oviduct. And if we see this little picture here of the common flower, basically the, the pollen or the sperm is, is um produced by the anther, which comes off the end, and it needs to come into that part of the flower. So basically any animal or mechanism which gets the pollen from one flower to another is pollination. Now, flowering plants have um, evolved with pollination as a major factor of their reproductive processes, and around 87% of flowering plants need some level of pollination across the world. And it's estimated that there are over 200 thousand species of insects which have a role in pollination. So this is a pretty, pretty big topic that we're talking about today. When we look at um, pollinated, pollination in agriculture, it's obviously a fundamental part of quite a lot of the crops, um, less of a big deal in um, broad, broad acre cropping, um, but also very, very important for um, the hort industry. And there are lots of different types of crops which either have just an increased yield or actually completely rely on pollination, such as canola can actually have an increased yield, um, lucerne to a lesser extent, but also you know, things like almonds, some berries, melons and apples, they really rely on this pollination service. And if we kind of look at the amount of food that is produced across the whole world, about 35% of all the food produced of the volume of food relies on pollination. If we look at this just in Australia, the amount of money that has been put towards this equals about $6 billion per year. So pollination is very, very important to the production of food in Australia. Now, when we think about pollination in Australia, we generally start off by thinking about honeybees because we do rely on these introduced species to do a lot of the commercial pollination in agricultural systems. They are highly effective pollinators, which is why they've been used by beekeepers and agriculturalists for you know, thousands of years. Um, but they do often rely on commercial beekeepers to keep these bees and their hives healthy. And just to give you a little bit of a picture of, of the honeybees down the bottom here, this is what a kind of uh, a wild hive would look like when it's up on a tree. If you've ever had the experience to see one, it's really amazing to see what the combs look like. Um, we've got a picture of a bee here carrying the pollen along on her back leg and obviously a commercial beehive, which is taken from one crop to the next in order to pollinate. But it's not really um, the best strategy to be putting all our eggs in this basket. 
Um, we've seen, as you know, in cases in the US where they've had large problems with what we call colony collapse syndrome, where there's been huge numbers of bees that have died off and they've actually had quite significant problems with pollinating some of their um, almond crops as a result. And of course, the varroa mite. We couldn't talk about pollination without talking about this recent incursion. We now have varroa mite in New South Wales, you know, ideally we wouldn't have it in Australia long term, but it's looking like it's going to be a threat that we need to deal with um, for a long time in the future. So the solution to this may be that we actually have over 1,700 species of native bees in Australia. We don't particularly have to rely on these honeybees because there's a huge amount of variation out there. And I'm just going to introduce you to some of these native bees um, very, very quickly this morning. This afternoon. <laughs> um, one of my absolute favourites that people sometimes don't recognise is called a teddy bear bee. And these are quite large bees. I guess if you've ever met a bumblebee, you're looking at that kind of size. And these are quite interesting in the fact that they don't live in big hives. They live down a hole and they hatch out at a particular time of year. Um, the female lays her egg in a little hole there. Um, and if you're ever lucky enough to hear one, you can really hear them. They've got a very, very loud buzz as they go past. They're a fantastic and large Australian native bee. Another similar bee in this um, group is the blue banded bees. And they're very, very common where I am in Sydney. And I think you also have them down in Victoria um, who are really, really attracted to this purple color. And you'll see them often in gardens. They've got this beautiful little um, stripe across their back, that blue stripe. And both of these two types of bees have what we call buzz pollination. So they get into the flower and the, the really the vibrating action is actually what the flower needs in order to be pollinated. And there are quite a few crops uh, like tomatoes and um, strawberries, which where buzz pollination is a really important factor in actually pollinating those plants as well. Um, that's why um, uh, bumblebees are often used to pollinate these kind of crops. But we also, there's potential that these native bees could be used there as well. Talking about some kind of other native bees that you might see um, in some of these systems, resin bees are these very, very cute little bees that um, they bury down into the, the um, into like long um, sticks and they make their little tunnel in there and they actually cap off the front of it with resin. They're often the kind of bees that you'll see if you've got a bee hotel, you'll see that kind of ready resin at the end. Um, and that's just another example of Australian native bee. Uh, leaf cutter bees as well. We do sometimes have people that come to us and ask what's attacking their roses. They ask why they've had these big circles taken out of their roses. Um, and sometimes the culprit is not actually a pest, but it's one of these gorgeous native bees. So what they do is they cut this very, very kind of exact circle out of the leaf and they do love roses. And then they take it back similar to the resin bees. They'll live in a long hollow. They'll roll up that leaf and they'll use it to lay their eggs in. And finally, I'll just tell you a little bit about these stingless bees because they're one of the species that have the most commercial um, prospects in Australian agriculture. They're very, very small. So if you look at that picture of one on the flower, they're kind of about half the size of your fingernail. They're often mistaken for flies because of the kind of the way they fly around. But if you've ever, if you've ever seen a, a native beehive, they're, they're very, very cute and they will kind of um, swarm and, and fly into that native, into that hole within their hive as well. Um, so they are social bees, unlike the, um, the teddy bear bees, which I spoke about before, but they, they, their comb is quite different. So this beautiful picture here of a really spiral type of comb that they make within that box. Um, so you can keep um, stingless bees commercially, and there's been some research looking at how well they can be used to pollinate crops. So they've looked at um, their ability to pollinate things like macadamias, mangoes, watermelons and lychees, and there's real potential there, but they're also doing trials, trials with other crops. So I'm really excited about this space because I think there's a huge amount of potential. Uh, at the moment, it is still very small scale though. You can see this nice picture here um, of the, the native bees out in a crop, but um, we're really not seeing anywhere near the numbers that you would have for native, for um, the honeybees. So um, it, it's gonna be a growing space, I think. Native bees can be quite effective within greenhouses because you've kind of got a closed system there. Um, but again, one of the best ways to kind of long-term to think about native bee pollination is to create an ecosystem around them that will support these species rather than having to bring them in intentionally and then relying on that commercial um, application of the bees. 
But in order to do this, we, we require quite diverse landscapes. There's quite a lot of research out there that shows that these um, native bees don't do so well when you've got one broad um, cropping area um, where there's just one species in mono mono species kind of areas. So we need to possibly think a little bit differently about the way that we do our cropping. But I will just say that bees aren't the only species that can be pollinators. As I said at the very beginning, basically the transfer of pollen from one flower to another, any way that that is done is a pollinator. So you might notice the first picture along here um, might look a little bit like a bee, but this is actually a hoverfly. So they are flies rather than bees. We know that because they've only got one pair of wings here rather than two that you would sort of see on a bee. And the reason that they've actually evolved to look very much like a bee is an anti-predator response. So any kind of predator like a bird will learn pretty quickly that they don't want to eat a bee. They get stung if they try. Uh, and the, the hoverflies have evolved to take advantage of that to look just like a bee so that the birds who have learnt this don't attack them. Um, so it's quite nifty in that way. The way that you can tell the difference is those two wings, as I said, but they've also got quite flattened bodies and they really do, uh, you know, they act as, the, as their name says, they really quite hover over the top of flowers. And sometimes you'll look over a bed of flowers and you'll just see them hovering everywhere. Actually, at this time of year, you'll start seeing them. So take a look at the next time you're out in a garden or a native area. Um, even just the common house fly can actually be a really good pollinator as well. People often ask me, what's the point of flies? Could we just kill all the flies? Um, no, we definitely couldn't kill all the flies. They do play a really important role in pollination as well. Um, beetles too. People often don't think very much about the humble beetle, but there's lots of species of beetle um, that can take pollen from one, bee, from one flower to another. This particular one seems to be doing a very good job. It's absolutely covered in pollen. Um, and things like butterflies and moths as well can be really good pollinators. So when we're talking about encouraging pollinators, we're not just talking about encouraging native bees. We're really talking about a diversity of insect life because there's a lot and lot of different species that could be doing those jobs. Um, but also, you know, it's not just insects. Um, there are a lot of mammals and birds which can act as really good pollinators as well. So this is just another plug for biodiversity, basically. There's lots of different species we could be encouraging out there to do these important jobs. And there's some pretty cute ones here too. So I want to just talk quickly about the threats that pollinators are facing before I hand over to Lewis. One of the major things is the loss of the habitat of these species, but also the fragmentation of habitat. So they can't actually get enough food resources within the patch that they've got. And um, they're not able to travel between the different plots of habitat. And so they lose genetic diversity. Um, they also possibly don't get enough diversity in their food sources if the, if the fragments of habitat are quite small and they won't have enough room to nest. So this is a particular problem in agriculture where you have large monocultures and not enough of those habitat or that food in between those crops, especially um, if the crops are only flowering at a particular time of year, then you don't have the resources during another part of the year. Now, pesticides and pollution are a really large factor here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about pesticides later, but basically there are some pesticides which are instantly lethal to bees and, and any other insect. And that's a, that's a problem for these particular in, um, pollinators but you can also have sublethal effects. And this is where um, you may not see an instant effect to something like a honeybee. Um, you know, they may land on a flower that's been sprayed and then fly off and you think it's all good, but the actual the effect comes in a little bit later in that it affects their biology or they take that um, pesticide back to their hive and it infects the babies. Um, and there has been quite a lot of research, especially in the US with particular pesticides that shows that things like neonicotinides can actually have this sublethal effect where they affect the memory of the bee. So when they fly out, they're not actually able to find their way back home again. And that's basically as good as being dead for a honeybee. So I think that this area of sublethal effects is something that really needs quite a bit more attention and quite a bit more research about the ways that these pollinators could be affected beyond just it instantly killing them. Um, but of course, as we saw with Varroa, things like introduced viruses and diseases is a big deal, and introduced species can compete with our native honeybees for resources. Now, if we want to talk about which um, pesticides are toxic to bees, it's um, a lot of them. Most of the insecticides that we would have registered in Australia, especially for broadacre cropping, will impact bees, if not kill them directly. Um, 
Primacarb is an exception there, which is a bee-friendly pesticide, but also note that there are some surfactants which are mixed with the chemicals. So even if you have a bee-friendly um, pesticide, um, then you know, that surfactant can actually be what causes the problem rather than the pesticide itself. But there are some ways you can reduce the risk to bees in particular if you're spraying. Um, this doesn't apply for all per, per, for all pollinators, um, but it does help with, with bees. The, some of those rules are that you would never spray on a flowering crop because that's when the bees are going to come in and get directly exposed to it. But also something which people don't think about is spraying those non-target plants. So often, you know, you would go out and spray the weeds um, and that's they're, at, they're still flowering. And so the bees are still visiting those weeds and that's where they get exposed to the pesticide. Taking into consideration insecticide drift and making sure that this insecticide isn't going on to flowering plants or hives, but also the water sources. So bees can actually be um, contaminated through these pesticides, through the water that they take back to the hive as well. Um, and they, they can contaminate their nectar pollen or water. Uh, and also combinations of insecticides can be a problem, even if they're judged bee safe, um, then they can actually, when you combine them together, they then become not safe for bees anymore. So more ways that we can reduce these risks is to really make sure you pay attention to the labels of the sprays that you're using um, and about um, dosage rates and when to use them and understand this residual risk to bees. So some chemicals will have an instant risk and others will actually stay in the environment for a longer period of time. They might get taken up into the pollen and that's where they present the risk. And always select the chemicals with the lowest risk to bees and the lowest residual risk. Um, it is really important if you are spraying and you're in, you're in crop production um, that you communicate with the beekeepers as well, which I'm sure most people would be thinking about anyway, but making sure that there are no bees that are commercially in the area when you're spraying. And also choosing appropriate conditions. So if it's a very windy day, it's important not to be spraying because that increases the spray drift. And I've just put this picture of this document here because it's a really um, good overview of some of these tactics that people can use to, to decrease um, the risk that the, is faced by honeybees when being sprayed commercially. So I have a last section that I will finish up with, but I'm just going to hand over to Lewis, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what kind of plants um, attract bees in, in gardens. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, can you see my slides? Excellent. Beautiful. Well, I just got a great opportunity to talk to you about beneficials and pollinators and just follow up on, on the conversation that Lucy has just started. I'm going to go into a little bit of a different tack and want, would like to share with you more about how can we potentially bring these pollinators and beneficials into our gardens. And when I mean gardens, I'm going to be very broad about that definition, right? It's just this idea that anywhere where you plant plants, right? And that could be your own little garden in your house, or maybe you have a larger property where you have some land. Um, but even the paddock, right? It's this idea that you could potentially surround your paddocks with a garden, a garden of indigenous plants, a gardens of plants that attract uh, these pollinators. So let's talk about that a little bit with that broad sense. So I'm going to show you a few slides here just to introduce you again and to this idea of what this conversation could look like, right? Here is uh, an indigenous native pollinator bee, as Lisi was mentioning before, and it's attracted to a uh, wattle, so our typical wattle flowers um, that we have here in Australia. So that's just, you know, your very typical example of a native bee on a native plant. But here's another example where we still have an indigenous plant, uh, but in this case, what we're seeing is a non-indigenous pollinator, a non-indigenous bee. It's not the honeybee in this case. It's, uh, it's another bee that came from South Africa fairly recently and has now spread. It, it came into cities first and it now spread to multiple cities in the country. Uh, so we don't know whether this species might also spread to agricultural environments, for example. But just as an example of a non-honeybee a non also introduced species. Now, here's a very, very interesting one. I really love this one because it alludes to what Lissy was saying, right? Like a non-bee pollinator, a non-bee beneficial. 
In this case, this is a wasp, and it's very closely related to a beneficial wasp or a parasitoid that you probably all heard of uh, that in the context of agricultural environments, right? Uh, they act as predators and they parasitize aphids and, and other uh, pests, right? But in this case, these wasps um, need flowers to complete the life cycles. As adults, they need to feed and they would go and feed on flowers, potentially also pollinating. So just to give you a broader kind of more big view picture of, of how then flowers can help our beneficials in multiple ways beyond just by providing um, nectar and pollen. And the last one here, maybe not so well known, is that even ants, so we have hundreds of species of ants, uh, and again, very beneficial insects in all our systems, whether it's in a city or in a, in a paddock, and they will also come and, and feed on, on these flowers, right? Because in Australia, the, our indigenous plants are providing an enormous amount of resources in the form of nectar, a lot of sugar content in our indigenous plants. And that's a good thing because they could provide energy for these pollinators and beneficials. So sometimes it's not only thinking, oh, am I providing you know, the nectar and the, it's this, the, the pollen, it's the nectar too that is really rich in energy for our insects. So kind of like to summarize this little bit of slides, right? I just wanna kind of make you think, all of you here present today about this question a little bit, right? What themes drew your attention the most during these slides and, and the broader topic of pollinator and pollinators and beneficials? Um, for me, for example, uh, and I hope you might have some different one, feel free to comment in the chat or, you know, like have, have any questions or if you wanna comment on these ones, I'll just show you what I think are themes that I have learned by talking to this to a whole bunch of people, right? Um, I have learned, for example, that it brings back this idea of indigenous culture, sort of almost in a follow-up to our acknowledgement to country early on, is this acknowledgement that we're looking at indigenous pollinators and we're looking at indigenous plants and their interactions. And these would have been known to indigenous people um, way before we started noticing them, right? And so in a way, it's it kind of connects us back with that culture of of in things being indigenous. So in that same logic, right, um, then it was really obvious that we had indigenous and non-indigenous species. So Lissy referred to as the honeybee and presented a whole bunch of alternatives to the introduced honeybee. So we had those two types of species there. And I think that's gonna be a theme and I'll show you more about that in, when I show you some more scientific findings that we're doing in this space. And so obviously we had pollination, that was very clear and, and uh, but some, you know, taking it to a different level of just pollination, I want to introduce this idea that, uh, that there were some more complex interactions happening there. And these interactions is something that we, you, all of us can foster in, in the environments where we live and we grow our food, right? So it's that example of the wasp where you could be providing food and then the wasp can be controlling your pests and, and so on, right? The interactions with the birds and the mammals. So there's a little bit of that thinking all throughout this conversation. And then again, that I think our indigenous plants have quite unique traits, this idea that they provide a lot of sugar, a lot of energy, and, and that's something that we can bring into our gardens, into our paddocks. This idea that we're providing energy with these plants, uh, that it's needed for all our, our broader biodiversity, broadly speaking. Excellent, thanks. So after that little bit of an intro, let's delve into this idea of how can we support uh, pollinators and beneficials. I wanna start here with some findings from my colleagues and I, um, when it came to this space of trying to understand what would be the best plants that we could use in, in our gardens and paddocks to support uh, insects and beneficials and pollinators. So, um, here in this graph to the left, right, our attempt was to divide things into, say, for example, a lawn in a city, a mid-story type vegetation, so the type that you would put around your paddock, for example, and the tree canopy, right? And then we divided those plants into plants that were non-native to Australia, that were native to Australia, but not to Victoria in this example, and then plants that were purely indigenous to Victoria. And here, what we measured was the number of insects, indigenous insects, right? So at this stage, we're just talking about indigenous insects that were found in each type of plant. 
And you can see then that immediately the, the largest amount of insects were found in the midstory and the tree canopy of indigenous plants to Victoria. Now we suspect that this is likely to happen in New South Wales and, and, and Western Australia. In all our states, a similar pattern could happen. Now uh, to the right, uh, it's a very similar type of finding but where we have gone in into the specific types of plants that could potentially be in a midstory. So now we're talking about things very specifically, like it could be a forb, um, so like something, you know, like something that could look like, uh, like an ornamental canola or something, uh, but also our two sub grasses and any kinds of shrubs. And again, when we divide that by non-native, native to Australia or indigenous to Victoria, um, how interesting that, the group of plants that are the strongest in attracting insects in general were the two sub grasses, right? Uh, and this included pollinators. So it's a really interesting story about that Lisa referred to before, right? Is that the pollinators, the beneficial insects, are not just using the flower parts of the plant, they're potentially using other parts of the plants um, to uh, reproduce or deposit, lay their eggs, etc. So a very strong case here in this first kind of uh, touch of base with this topic is that the indigenous plants are really good, really good at attracting indigenous insects, including all the beneficials that we've been discussing. And I just wanted to uh, leave this slide here for you in case you're interested in connecting the story about the indigenous plants with the potentially indigenous cultural significance of them. Uh, and just want to point you out to this booklet from my colleague, Sina Constan. Um, where she discusses the indigenous plant use and some indigenous cultural stories about most of the plants uh, that we found in that previous study that I was showing you. So something that if you're interested in, is a very good source of, of information um, that I definitely recommend you, you checking out. Now, I wanna connect this now with this idea that things, complex interactions, right, that I was discussing before, and just to show how then our multiple groups of insects are connected with the plants. So in this case, from another study we conducted, um, this was just to prove that you could change a garden, right? A small space, plant some indigenous plants and then attract a whole bunch of beneficial insects. Uh, so I, I run you through, this, through the slides, through the graph a little bit. Um, when we started the study, this particular site, this particular garden only had a little bit of lawn and one tree. So that's what you see here in white. So very little interactions. In fact, we only found four species of insects in this site. So a tree and a lawn was providing habitat for four insects. Um, a year after uh, the greening, so to speak, right, this indigenous plants, about 12 indigenous plants came into this one garden and then only after three years, this is how the network of interaction looks. So we're talking about almost a hundred species across all kinds of groups that Lissy mentioned, flies, wasps, pollinators, herbivores, parasitoids, ladybugs, everything, right? Uh, that were attracted to this one garden in the middle of the city of Melbourne, right? So I can only imagine if you have your paddock next to say a area of remnant vegetation or a national park or a landscape, right? That is not fully urbanized, the power of attracting these potential insects, uh, beneficial insects into areas uh, where they might help with growing a food. And then also just to then how this has been uptaken mostly in urban environments, right? With this idea of wildlife gardening, which is this idea that um, you can start doing that in your front garden, in your back garden, thinking about the plants, not just for the purpose of having a beautiful garden or having a lot of indigenous plants in your garden just for that sake, but also thinking of how that is helping the community of insects and birds and other, and other animals. So it's a kind of very nice approach to, to thinking of how can you help and steward or bring that kind of biodiversity closer to you. And I think this is perfectly applicable uh, to agricultural landscapes as well. So again, let's try to look uh, more specifically, right? I wanna keep going into like how we as researchers, we kept thinking about this question again and again, if this is the starting point, where to take it from here. And I'm gonna show you findings from another study 
that delves more into this kind of attraction between indigenous plants and, and beneficial insects. So this specific study, right, was conducted at various places around Melbourne, as I'm showing you here. And again, the idea was to look at the pollinators and specifically the pollinators in this case that are attracted to indigenous plants uh, across a very large area and across a whole year. So that way we understand what's happening with the seasons too. And so the, it followed this idea of building interactions and building networks. So you can imagine that in each garden, each locality that we visit, uh, we build this network of interactions between the beneficial, between the pollinators and the flowers. And this is sort of like the big numbers, what we found, right? We documented over 800 interactions um, and there were heaps of local indigenous plants. And then we found heaps of local indigenous uh, bees and other pollinators. So that's really, really interesting to see the large amounts of things that can be attracted when you start looking closely. Now, here's just a slide just to show you the, the wide range of flowers that we looked at. Uh, so all of these are indigenous plants that are very easily accessible in local indigenous nurseries. So these are things that you could be planted in your gardens, right? And, and as I understand, um, they would perfectly work well in, in areas of regional Australia, right? Closer to even potentially adjacent to your paddocks, right? These are plants that can easily grow in the type of soils that we have. And here is just, just some, some of those, you know, heaps of species that we found. Lisi spoke about a few of them already, including the blue banded bee here, for example. Lewis, and, sorry, that screen's not coming up. Maybe you could just go back and forward one. Which one are you seeing now? Uh, the plant species. And now? Perfect, that, there we are. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry for that then. Um, I was just saying that some of the examples that Lisa, you mentioned were the, for example, the blue banded bee, the leaf cutter bees, uh, the resin bees and so on. So yeah, we definitely, definitely found those that theoretically should be around, they, they come, but also a wide range of beetles, these flower attracting beetles that Lisa referred to, and obviously butterflies and, and other things. Now here is where like, uh, you know, like we start connecting, right? Like, I hope we never forgot that, you know, we're talking about honeybees, for example, being present. And of course we found a lot of them. Um, and we found a lot of cabbage white and that South African bee that I was referring to. And so there's, there's a, yeah, there's this, at least some species of introduced pollinators that are common. And I think it tells that story, right? It's not, it's not like you're just gonna be able to attract the indigenous pollinators, you're also gonna attract the non-indigenous ones, um, but that's just part of the story. So they, they know how to feed on our plants, they, um, and that's why they're potentially equally good at pollinating crops and pollinating indigenous plants. So it's, it's all serving this purpose, which is quite interesting and nuanced. I'll show you some more kind of like scientific findings, right? When you consider the number of pollinator species that you can potentially attract on average, um, the number of indigenous ones, it's much higher compared to the number of introduced insects. So while they're present, the indigenous plants are mostly attracted indigenous insects, which is good. But it's not like every single plant attracts the same number of pollinators. So it's a story about how it's interesting. You would like to want to choose properly um, if this is what you were after, right? So uh, maybe these plants here um, are the ones that we found uh, attract the largest number of insect pollinators, right? And so that's good. If you don't have a specific preference, you could be using these. But who knows, maybe down here are the ones that you really want to plant in your gardens. Um, but, you know, sort of it tells a story that if you really want to inform your plant in your plant selection to attract bees, it's definitely possible to do it. And then we would be recommending planting some of the ones um, down here on the left side of this graph because they attract many more pollinators than the ones down here. And then again, putting that in the context of this network of interactions that I spoke before, uh, again, you have all the indigenous plants here in green on this side, these green nodes that you have here. And then in blue, I have 
um, depicted the introduced, sorry, the indigenous pollinators. And then in purple, they introduced ones. So mostly honeybees, right? So then again, it's, it's kind of saying it's inevitable that you will attract also honeybees. Maybe that's a good thing, right? Like depending on what you're after or both things at the same time, but it definitely attracts a whole range, a wide range of indigenous pollinators. Um, so that's, that's really good. Uh, so you can serve for purposes uh, and there's still a lot of indigenous pollinators that are being attracted with these plants. So I touch only very the touch, you know, the very briefly on this topic, but if you're interested in, uh, this is a publicly available report and then all of the plants are clearly uh, depicted with their names and scientific names. So you can go and find out what these plants were, the ones that attracted um, the largest diversity of insects and all our methods and everything is neatly described in this publicly available report. And I just want to finish with one little uh, story about sort of kind of like um, almost falling in love with this idea that you can actually attract these beautiful and very beneficial pollinators to, to your gardens and just by doing gardening and by planting, right? Um, I wasn't, I had never really seen this little bee before. It's called a mask bee uh, because it presents these little kind of like stripes here in the black face, head, and it's in banksia tree. So we're all very familiar. I'm sure we're all familiar with our banksias, uh, you know, grows into very beautiful trees, uh, mostly around the whole country. As, um, and yeah, they like, they attract an immense number of honeybees that are the ones that you first see. But if you look closely, uh, you will find this little introduced uh, native bees uh, collecting um, nectar. And they do it in this very beautiful way of producing this kind of like really nice bubbles that they then share and take back to each other. So it's a kind of really beautiful thing to see. Um, and I just wanted to leave it with that. So for you to appreciate. So thank you very much. And I'll pass it back to Lissy to conclude the webinar. Thanks, Lewis. I love that species as well. I remember the first time that I um, found one on a Banksia in Western Australia. It was one of those ones with the really yellow triangle. I was just so blown away. They're very, very cute. Now, I'm just going to finish up the webinar very quickly with a couple of tips on how you can get to know the local pollinators in your area and have the same experience that Lewis and I have about just getting really silly about finding really cute bees in our gardens. Um, it doesn't need a huge amount of equipment. You know, you could be an entomologist. You could go out there with all the gear possible and probably still see the same number of bees as someone who's just sitting and looking. There are some really lovely resources out there. So there's a couple of guidebooks for native bees. And if you're more interested in the commercial side of things and having stingless bees, which can be used for crop pollination, there's a good book by Tim Hurd about how to keep stingless bees. Um, but there are a couple of ways that you can kind of get support with identification and with, with um, understanding a little bit more about the biology of the species you're seeing in your gardens as well. And we often like to talk about the app called iNaturalist, which is a really neat way to capture an image of the bees or the pollinators that you're seeing in your garden. In fact, of any animal, plant, fungus that you find and uploading it into this app. And the nice thing about iNaturalist is that it's a network of amateur um, you know, enthusiasts and specialists all across the world. So you kind of, you upload your little picture, you can tell them where it was, you can give it a little bit of information about what kind of plant it was. And you can, it will give you a suggestion of what species it thinks it is. It's not always completely correct, but you can kind of usually get it down to close to what kind of um, group that particular insect is in. Um, but then actually the experts that are part of this platform will often come on and either tell you you're right or give you a suggestion as to what species it might be. So this is a completely free and a completely open source way of, of getting a, um, an identification on the types of species you're seeing. It can also be really nice because you kind of you end up with your own little collection. So you can actually... Um, kind of document the biodiversity that you're finding within this app in your own garden. And I think that's really lovely to get a record of that. One of the nice things about iNaturalist is it also feeds the information back to science so that um, the, the points come into what's called the Atlas of Living Australia. And that means that anybody can come on and see where all the records of a particular species are. So I've used the blue banded bee here as an example. If 
you know, a researcher such as Lewis was interested in working out where other people had seen this bee, he can come in, he can actually download all the information for where people have spotted it, and that might help him to get an idea of the range of this species or where to go looking for it. Um, so it's actually, it's really useful for scientists as well when you use this kind of um, data tracking. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Native Pollinator Week, which is coming up. Um, there used to be the Wild Pollinator Count, which unfortunately isn't running this year because the program came to an end. But if you check out the website for the Wild Pollinator Count, they've still got a really good amount of information on there about how to work out which species you're looking for. There's some really good resources there and lots and lots of information on native species as well. And there's bound to be lots of um, events that are happening as native, native Pollinator Week in your own local area as well. So keep an eye out for them. And really the best place to start is just to get out there and have a look. Um, the whole idea with the wild pollinator count was that you just sat and watched a flower for 10 minutes. You know, it's, it's a very, very easy, low level thing to do. Um, but so many people got on board with it because they were actually fascinated with the number of insects that they were able to record coming in. So I would challenge all of you today to take a step outside. If it's sunny and not raining like it is here, um, then you can take a step outside, you know, take a look at some flowers and see what kind of species you find. Um, that's the formal part of the presentation done. Um, and Lewis has put some good resources in that um, the chat in there for you as well. If anyone has any questions, we can stay on a little bit longer. But otherwise, thank you very much for attending today and um, hope to connect with you again sometime in the future. Thank you so much, Lizzie and Lewis. That was amazing. I really found that so interesting. And please, if you have any questions, just um, you can unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Um, I was one of those people during COVID that adapted my whole backyard and I have no more grass on my property and it's a small urban backyard and the changes within a year is incredible in what it's bringing um, of insects to the um, backyard. But something that really fascinates me is watching uh, the native mint, the prostantheria, my pronunciation isn't probably very good, um, but how it's, it's flies. I've only ever seen two bees when it's flowering on that bush. The rest is flies, native flies. And is that something like going back to your research, Lewis, that it, some pollinators might just stick to, you know, or, or one plant might attract a certain type of pollinator? Uh, yeah, oh, that's a great observation, Liz, thanks. Yeah, I think that's exactly what our research is, is showing that depending on the type of plant, maybe because depending on the flower morphology or you know, its shapes or its colors, um, yeah, it might it might attract just a specific group or type of species. Um, flax lilies, for example, you might be familiar with are very good at attracting blue banded bees and attracting uh, another other types of native bees, for example. Um, Hope goodenia, which is a very common plant across the country, is very good at attracting uh, blue banded bees, although it's yellow, not, not violet. As, so there is things that if you start observing and the research is increasingly going to help us make those connections. Fantastic. Have we got any questions there? Oh, do we have bumblebees? Yes. Um, so I, I wrote back, we do have bumblebees oh. in Tasmania. Um, but they are introduced and they're actually, you know, we don't sometimes introduce species have their place and bumblebees can be really good pollinators, but we would still prefer not to have them. <laughs> um, but there's actually some research groups from the University of Sydney who are studying those bumblebees at the moment um, to work out what, what harm, if any, they're doing in those Tasmanian ecosystems. Yeah. Um, so it was me who asked the question, sorry. Um, I definitely, they're not blue banded bees. I know that for sure. And it's definitely not a fly. So the next time I see them, I'll try and take a photo on a video because I don't know what they are. But like I said, it's definitely not, we've got blue banded bees, Yeah. but they, they're they real. And when I was in Europe and we saw bumblebees, they're really similar. Yeah. So I also don't know, I, I don't know if it's something that's come, you know, the spirit of Tasmania used to dock in, like if yeah. it's a hitch to ride. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, you came on a bit late and missed the first bee that Lizzie spoke about, which was the teddy bear bee. And I think that might be what you're seeing. Yeah, that would be my suggestion as well. So that's the picture in the top left-hand corner there. Do you have any other suggestions of what it might be, Lewis? 
Um, there is one that I have been seeing too. It's an indigenous species to Victoria, but also to Australia. And it's called the golden and green nomia. And it really pretty much looks like a, could potentially be confused with the bumblebee too. So there are a few species that are in that kind of range. Um, but yeah, Claudia, send us a photo. We'll love to, to see what you're finding. So do blue banded bees and teddy bear bees have a similar nesting habitat? Well, I know particularly for the teddy bear bees, they need to have soft ground in order to make their little burrow in. Um, I'm not so sure about the blue banded bee habitat. Do you know more about that, Lewis? Um, I will say that they will have very, very similar nesting habitats. In general, they, they're closely related species. And the only reason that they're not all called blue banded bees is because the teddy bear is, is sort of like, a, a distinct type of blue banded bee, let's put it that way. So they're very, very closely um, related, these two, these two kind of species that we refer to as blue banded bees and teddy bears. I think something that I find a lot, for the last nine years, I've run um, uh, bee motel workshops. So I will send anybody, everybody links to, to various resources in that. Um, what was I going to say about that? So the resin bees was one that we found a lot and they'd even, um, and the mass bees in making the, the motels, we even had some come and land <laughs> on somebody's finger, which was just incredible then to be able to witness that sizing against mm -hmm. a fingernail for say, and they, they're so tiny, um, but to be able to um, identify that. So I will send resources out. And we're really fortunate in the Central Tablelands to have Megan Holcroft, who has done her PhD on stingless bees. Mm -hmm. And she's created Bees and Other Beneficial Insects and Insect Pocket Guide. So I can send link to Bees Business also, so people can connect with that local um, resource. Wonderful. Is there any, uh, any other questions? No. Well, thank you both. That was just incredible. And um, yeah, I'm even more inspired about our um, pollinators and what I might see in the garden this weekend when I get home. Wonderful. Yeah, I hope everyone thank gets you. out there and sees some nice pollinators this spring. Yeah, and I will send a recording out probably early next week and with all the resources. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.